Hello guys and girls, how's it going? Screezilla here and I hope you're all well. And you join me today in the Nimrod. This is the Mark 1 version. And you join me for the history of the Nimrod. Now, in the history of videos, I look at history of vehicles in War Thunder and a couple of other games occasionally. But the majority in War Thunder, just because they have very good modelling of the vehicles, so I can actually show them in a bit better detail, and also show some interesting footage of gameplay, of course. So, let's get started. Today we're looking at the Hawker Norn, or as it was more commonly later known, the Nimrod. This is a British reserve and Tier 1 plane in War Thunder, and was a Royal Navy fighter. It was a successor to the Fairy Flycatcher, a naval biplane that was so obsolete by the time the Nimrod came to f came by the time the Nimrod came, the flying officers who flew it are often joked that a sprightly fly may actually give the plane a run for a for its money in a race. In 1929, the prototype Hawker Hoopy, uh, Hu Pu, sorry, pronunciation there. Uh, named after the bird with a distinctive crown of feathers on its head, um, was designed. It was not actually designed to the specifications of the Air Ministry's number 21-6 um, recommendations. However, it was the only promising plane of the trials at the set. It was tested with floats as a seaplane and had a Bristol Mercury radial engine equipped. However, this engine was replaced by the Armstrong Sidley, Jaguar and Panther engines later due to poor performance of the Mercury at the time. The Navy was set on having radial engines for their planes due to the ease of maintenance and ease of replacement of them. However, Sydney Cam... Now, I'm going to pause for a moment, something that I don't always do in these history of videos, to talk about a single person, and that is Sydney Cam. Sydney Cam, born in 19, sorry, 1893, started his passion with the aviation by founding the Windsor Model Aeroplane Club in 1912. Later that year, the club built their first man-carrying glider. Shortly before the outbreak of the First World War, Cam got a position as a carpenter at Martinside Aircraft Company, makers of the F-4 Buzzard, which mainly served with the Russians, 100 planes, Finnish, 15 planes, and Spain, with 30 planes. Um, some of which were actually fighting during the Spanish Civil War of 1936-39. Cam quickly rose to a position in the drawing office where he worked through the war, working on the aforementioned plane. In 1923, Cam joined the Hawker Aircraft Company as senior draftsman, where he designed his first plane, the Hawker Signet, a prototype used in racing. Um, the ultralight plane placed and won in a few important races, this led to Cam being appointed as chief designer in 1925. Now, these weren't pure racing planes. These were designed as um, planes to show off the skill of companies. So they had to be sort of like military or commercial aeroplanes. They weren't tweaked to the edge of endurance and edge of possibility like uh, other racing planes of the time. Along with Fred Sir, uh, Sir Hurst, they created a new form of construction using cheaper and simple, simpler jointed tubes rather than welded structure. This led to a much lighter, cheaper and easier to make plane. During his time with Hawker, Cam was responsible for 52 types of aircraft. Around uh, 26,000 planes were made from the designs he had made. Um, from the Tomet, the Fury and the Nimrod, to the Hurricanes, the Typhoons and the Tempests. And finally, the Hawker Hunter and the Kestrel, the prototype to the Harrier Jump Jet. He retired in 1965, but remained on the board until 66, where he sadly passed away by, while playing golf. At the time of his death, he was working on new, a new project for a Mark IV jet, along with the Bristol 188 and the BAC TSR II, meaning that Sydney Cam had worked, had started work on aircraft just as they'd come to life. He started his initial. He started his interest in flight just after man had taken to the sky. He worked on biplanes, monoplanes, pistons, and jets, designing planes for the First World War, Second World War, and up to the Gulf World. The, sorry, the Gulf War. Let's call it the Gulf World War then. 
Okay, back on track. As we see us taking on a Japanese plane here. Now, Cam knew that the future of, for ship born aircraft was inline engines, convinced by the success of the Fury, and this thus begun designing the uh, Nimrod with a Rolls-Royce Kestrel engine. The Air Ministry wrote new guidelines to fit the plane, not for the plane to fit it, uh, which is quite interesting because usually you have to fit the guidelines, the guidelines aren't written to fit you. And in 1930, the Norn had gotten the green light, now named the Nimrod. Overall, the Nimrod was similar to the Fury, a single-seater fighter. The main difference between them was the headrest for the pilot, and this was due to the extreme G-loads uh, when the plane was taken off. Sorry, when the plane was taking off from carriers. Fixed undercarriage and twin guns with an interrupter gear to allow the firing through the propellers. The wings had a strong stagger and a small overall length, meaning it was good for carriers as you could fit more on. Uh, they also, I believe, had some folding capabilities. The other advantage of staggering the wings with the N form struts meant the pilot had good visibility. The wings were fabricated covered with metal spars and spruce wooden ribs with the ailerons on the upper wing on only, um, which is not too common in biplanes, usually they have the ailerons on both sets of wings, but due to the forward section of these wings, it meant you had more air going over the top wing. The bottom wing was just there to provide lift. The wings were fabricated, uh, sorry, the wings were fabric covered with, fabric covered metal spars and, oh sorry, I've got on that. Another use, uh, the fuselage was uh, a Warren grinder structure of tubular inserts and tubular steel and aluminium with uh, metal strings that gave it its shape. The engine cowling and cockpit were aluminium with the rest of the plane being fabric. A second version of the Nimrod was made with a slightly larger rudder section to aid with spin recovery and the Kestrel 5 engine. Originally it was going to have a fuselage of steel, but only three of these were made. The Mark II came in 1933, some two years after the original had taken to the air. The Nimrod never fired its guns in anger, operating with the Royal Navy from 1932 until 1939, being replaced by the more modern Sea Gladiators. Although there are no records of the Nimrod flying in combat, it is possible they may have been flown in some combat missions uh, by the Danish Air Force. Um, however, I can't find any records of this. Eight of the ten Nimroden, uh, the Danish version, were taken by the Germans as spoils of war. Okay, so that is the history of the Nimrod. Now, let us talk a little bit about this plane. So let's just switch back onto here so we can see sort of what's going on in this, this dogfight that's coming up. Um, the Nimrod was a good plane for its time. It was small, it had very good lift efficiency, um, it was very good at turning, and it is very good at turning in game. That's your main strength. You have to use this as a turn fighter. Uh, you're better off boom and zooming, um, you know, getting a bit of altitude, and using the altitude to gain speed, because the engine does not have enough power to get you much speed, in all honesty. Um, one of the big advantages, as I say, is the turning of this plane, because it is an absolute beast in a turn fight. You will outturn pretty much anything at this BR, uh, mainly due to the staggering of the wings. It gave it a very good turning capability. One of the issues is the 12-cylinder Kestrel engine, uh, as it does have a tendency to overheat quite a bit. Uh, in this game, I actually overheated the engine by just running it. Uh, there was no damage, nothing at all, but the water had evaporated by the time of the mission end. Well, by the time of me, me getting to the airstrip, in fact. Um, because you don't have any controls for the radiator of the water, uh, because the water radiator is... Uh, if we just switch to this camera here. The water radiator is just in this spot here, and that's your oil radiator just there. And because there's such a low water radiator there, it just doesn't do a good job. Uh, so you have to fly this plane quite carefully not to overheat that water system. Um, 
the other thing is it is about much slower than the Fury as well. Um, well, not much, but a bit slower than the Fury. So it doesn't have the speed of that land-based version. The Fury is a much better plane all in all. The twin guns are... Well, they're twin 7.7s. So they're not great, in all honesty. Um, you do have quite a lot of rounds. But you do need quite a lot of rounds to take out the plane using the Vickers E machine guns. Um, you've got 600 rounds per gun, so, you know, as I said, it, it's not too bad, but you, the amount of damage they do is pretty, um, pretty awful. However, if you get this plane in a turn fight, it is an absolute monster. Um, this KI-43 here is going to be a great example of it. Now, the Nimrod 1 and 2, there's not really much difference between the two, in all honesty. Um, they are very similar planes. Uh, In-game, it's mainly just the paint job that you'll notice the difference. The slightly larger rudder does help with some stability, uh, but mainly you'll notice that in Sim. In RB and Arcade, you really don't have any difference. Overall, this is one of the best sort of reserve biplanes, in my opinion. Um, maybe the Falcon, the Italian CR-42, with the um, because it has the uh, slightly larger caliber guns. It's got the sort of almost the 50 cows on board. Um, it is a little bit better, uh, but other than that, it is one of the better biplanes out there. So this Ki-43-2 here, we've got in a fight. Now he's diving, and he's trying to get me into a turn fight here. Which is not a good idea, because I can out-turn him, and also because I have a lower stalling speed, I can go much slower than him as well. He's trying to get me to overshoot here. Now this is a great example of this plane's strength, because it just will keep turning and turning. The problem is, is when you are low and turning, you will lose all your energy very quickly. However, because of the great lift efficiency of this plane, you don't need that much speed to keep elevated, basically. So he's scrubbing off as much energy as he can for me. And I'm getting a couple of good hits on the tail section. The good thing about the um, guns being where they are is that they are quite easy to aim. And we take him down with relative ease, all in all. Good try, but not good enough. We get some good hits on his tail, and that's the end of him. Well, I'm going to end the video here for this aspect. We're just going to jump back to the hangar to keep to just show over the plane in the hangar view. Um, but the rest of this game is very, very boring. We do end up losing because of AI losses, um, but it's about, well, it's about uh, 10 minutes now of just me flying to and back from the base. Uh, because, as I said, my water was overheating at this stage, so I needed to get back home. Um, I was feathering the engine as much as I could to try and cool it down, but unfortunately, when there's no water left in there, there's not much you can do to cool it down. Okay, let's head back to the hangar and have a look at the two planes. So, in that game we went well, we had three kills, as I say, um, as you may have seen as well, so that was a nice, nice way to, to do the game. So let's have a look in the hangar. So the Mark 1, um, very pretty plane, and the Mark 2, there's not really much difference. As I say, the only difference is the tail section just due to the rudder. Um, the engine as well, it should be the uh, slightly more powerful Kestrel engine in there. Um, but, oh no, they do actually have it as the more powerful one. Okay, good, good going to check that. So yeah, you do have that more powerful Kestrel engine in the Mark II, which does give you better speed uh, for taking off. You've got better acceleration in the Mark II, basically. So it's well worth using in that respect. The plane is very pretty. Um, the metal front fuselage does help a little bit, um, but you are very weak to a to an enemy on your 6. You will get blown out the sky pretty easily, um, mainly due to the, the cloth wings being quite easy to destroy. One of the advantages of the cloth wing, though, is bullets will pass through quite often. Um, so yeah, 
overall, that, that's the end of the video for today. I do hope you've enjoyed this one. Uh, please let me know below what you thought. And I will see you next time for more History Of. Thank you so much and have a lovely day. Bye-bye.